unit. We're now dealing with unit two. We're going to look at segments, lines, and angles. Lesson 2.1, graphing lines. The daytime location, don't forget a parent sign off. Okay, this page is reviewing some simple patterns and radicals. Do this completely on your own and then restart the video. No calculator. Pause. Welcome back. The primary thing you should have noticed is any radical times itself is just the number on the inside. So root 2 times root 2 is 2. That means this is going to be 5, 3, 7. Here, root 2 times root 2 is 2. 5 times 2, that would be 10. That is 5. That makes that 30. That is 25. That makes that 100. 3, that's going to make that 24. Then this is root 6. This is root 5, because root 5 times root 5 is 5, 2 times 5 is 10. Start the ones you got correct, redo the ones you got wrong. Today we're going to be graphing lines, graphing lines. Your vocabulary is the concept of rate, slope, y-intercept, x-intercept. Slope intercept equation of a line and point slope equation of a line. You should have a ruler handy today. Linear equations. Linear means line. So any kind of a linear equation means you're going to be working with some sort of line. Equation, of course, is two sides with an equal sign. When are these used? Very often, these are used in predictive CEOs and corresponding graphs. We'll see that at the end. Very much used in the financial realm, predicting, uh, even criminology, finding trends, predicting crimes and hotspots, um, correlations between health habits versus overall health. Anything that can have an observation and a prediction of data we're going to be using graphing of line. But before we talk about lines, we first have to talk about slope. And slope is rise over run. So rise is the up and down motion of a line. Run is the horizontal motion. So this lady over here in this very interesting sweat outfit, if you were to draw this line right there, of course the rise would be that motion that is straight up and down of the line, physically trace that, and the run would be the horizontal. Things you need to be aware of. We read slope, reading on a graph from left to right. So when a line goes upward from left to right, upward, that is a positive slope. When a line goes downward from left to right, that is a negative slope. Now, zero and no slope. It's kind of hard to understand the difference, but let's do this actually mathematically. Okay, so it's rise over run. Rise over run. I'd like you to physically trace this horizontal line. Now, a horizontal line has no rise to it, no up or down motion. So, rise. So, when we're doing rise over run, 
we have a zero in the rise and obviously an in, a number on the run, but zero over anything is just a zero. Vertical. Right, rise over run. Vertical has no left or right motion. It has no run. So it does have rise, but it has a zero in the denominator. And only God gets to divide by zero. So when you have a zero in the denominator, we call that undefined. Also known as no slope. Be very careful you don't mix up a zero slope with the concept of no slope. In general, I will try to use the terminology of undefined rather than using the term no slope because that can be students with zero. Y intercept. Y intercept is where there is a zero in the X component and a number in the Y component. That is the Y intercept. X intercept is where you have a number in the X component and a zero in the Y component. So let's take a close look here. The intercept means where does it cross the axis? This number right here, put a dot there. This is where the line crosses the y axis. That is why it's called the y intercept. And a y intercept there is zero because there's no left or right motion. And then negative three. So on this line, the red line intercepts the y-axis at 0, negative 3. That's called the y-intercept. The same line crosses the x-axis right there. That's going to be over 4 and no vertical motion. So it's 4, 0. That's your x-intercept. Notice in our example again, that was 0, negative 3. And this was positive 4, 0. So in the y-intercept, it's where the line crosses the y-axis. The x-intercept, it's where the line crosses the x-axis. Take a moment and say that to yourself. Pause the video. Okay, welcome back. Now, graphing these lines, be super careful with this. Ready? Take a look here. Do this with me. We have x equals negative 3. Oh, x. There's our x-axis. There's our y-axis. So we go along x. And we go 1, 2, 3. Ta-da! x equals negative 3. No. What I just did was incorrect. That single point there is not x equals negative 3. Because x equals negative 3 is a line. That point right there is going to be negative 3, 0. If I'm going to graph the line x equals negative 3, it is all the points where I have a negative 3 something. All points where you have this scenario. The easiest way to do this is to simply graph a bunch of points where it's negative 3 plus something. Then it becomes more apparent. So, Negative 3, 0, that's my first point. Let's graph another point. There is negative 3, positive 1. Negative 3, positive 2. 
negative three, positive three. You see what's going on here? If I keep going, x equals negative three. It is a vertical line. That entire line is x equals negative. Be very careful. These are lines, not points. So x equals 5, that's all the points where I have 5 and then something. So I start 5 comma 0, 5 comma 1, 5 comma 2, 5 comma 3, 5 comma 4, 5 comma 5. I can do 5 comma negative 1, 5 comma negative 2. I think you see what's going on here. That is a bad line. Let's try that again. So that's going to be x equals positive 5. And x equals 8. That's 8 comma 0. Excuse me, 8 comma something. Not 0 comma something. And of course, that's going to be at the 8, and it's a vertical line. So you are noticing that all of the x equal lines are vertical. So x equals anything. It's going to be a vertical line. x equals a single number. It's going to be a vertical line. Ready? Now, following what I did for the x's, I'd like you to try to graph these. y equals negative 6, 3, y equals 3, and y equals 7. Do this on your own, pause the video, and restart. All righty, let's see how you did. y equals negative 6, so we're down here at the negative 6, but this one's going to be a horizontal one. Because it's all the points where you have something and negative 6. All the points where. It's a horizontal line. Y equals 3. 1, 2, 3. Horizontal line. Again, that's where you have something and then a positive 3. And Y equals 7. Excuse me, that was X. Seven's up here. There's five, six, seven. And we have here, that is all the points where it is something and positive seven. So this is y equals 7 line, this is the y equals 3 line, and this is the y equals negative 6 line. Okay, now that we can do horizontal and vertical lines, now we're going to start working on sloped lines, sloped lines. And you guys are used to seeing this in what's commonly called y equals mx plus b. Let's write it out. y equals mx plus b. Notice I like to align that equation directly underneath what I'm going to graph. It makes it easier to graph. That's y equals mx plus b. When you go to graph this, we start this with what is called the B, and that is the Y intercept. And then we'll do slope separately, which is the M. Okay, so our Y intercepts, we're going to start at negative 4. 
And folks, it is the Y intersect. So you start on the Y axis. Y intersect starts on the Y axis. Say it with me. Y intercept starts on the Y axis. So I start with my point negative 4 right there. That's my Y intercept. Let's label it. That is 0, negative 4. Now our slope, we check. It's positive 1 third. We're going to rise one and run three, and because it's positive, we know that the line has to go up from left to right. It has to go up from left to right. So I'm going to rise one and run three, or I could go down one and left three. You're going to get the same thing. But either way, my final product line has to be a positive line. Now you get your straight edge. Always label your lines, please. So that is y equals positive 1 third x minus 4. Let's try another one. Start by writing your equation directly underneath. All right, y equals mx plus b. I like to circle my y-intercept. My y-intercept will be 0, positive 3. My y-intercept starts on the y-axis. So I'm at positive 3. Now my slope, anytime there's a whole number, you put it over 1. So my slope is negative 3 over 1. Now, I get a lot of students that are paranoid. It's like, is it the 3 that's negative? Is it the 1 that's negative? Is it both of them that's negative? And they get all messed up. Don't even worry about that. Let's get the big picture. The big picture is if it's a negative slope, my line must go downward from left to right. That's the big picture. A negative slope means it goes downward reading from left to right. So when I start at positive 3, I'm right there. And my rise is 3. And my run is 1. Don't be paranoid. Do I go up or do I go down? It doesn't matter. What? I'm going to rise 3. I want a negative slope, so in order for it to tilt negative, I'm going to go over 1. That's rise 3 over 1. Or I could go down 3 over 1. I get exactly the same thing. Remember, the ambition is to get a negative tilting line. Negative tilting line. Go right through that intercept. That was y equals negative 3x plus 3. Try this a third time. Start by writing your equation directly underneath it. I have y equals mx plus b. 
if you look here, and for your y-intercept on your y-axis, there's like nothing there. Okay, be very careful. Technically, it's not nothing. It's a zero. So our intercept here is simply going to be zero. So we start there. Our slope is positive. So we know our line has to tilt upward. Our rise is five. Our run is three. So I go up five. Run three, I'm going to go to the right because I want it to tilt to the right. Or I can go down five. And one, two, over to the left. The intercept again was zero. You should be doing with a straight edge, folks. Y equals 5 thirds X. You could technically put a zero there if you want to. All right, this page is on your own. Complete and then restart. Welcome back. Let's take a look. This one, my B is 5. I'm just going to shortcut. I'm not going to do all the work. It's 5. My slope is negative 3, 3 halves. So I want my line to go down from left to right. So I'm going to go down 3, over 2. I could have easily gone up 3 if I wanted to and over 2 this way. You should have gotten the same thing. Your line looks like so. Wow, my line went like so. Give me a second to get caught up here. Fast forward through a bunch of pages for some reason. Oh, very sensitive. Okay, let's try this again and try not to hit that button. Okay. So then you string it. Wow, wow, wow. And there's your line right there. We know it's negative because it tilts downward from left to right. This one right here, y equals mx plus b. So I start at my negative 5. And then it's positive. My slope is going to be 9 over 1. And it's going to tilt upward from left to right. So I go up 9. over one, that's y equals 9x minus 5. You should be correcting in red pen, the correct smiley face star check something. If you were off somehow, some way, you should be redoing your work. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a practical example of what's called a predictive example in the realm of finance. But we're going to first go through some basic scientific notation here. When you are graphing, you always have what's called an independent variable and a dependent variable. The independent variable is that which causes something to happen. And the dependent variable is that which happens as the result of something else. In graphs, along the x-axis, we graph the independent variable, x-axis. 
and we graph dependent variables on the y-axis. Let me give you an example of how this works. Let's finger check and read together. Ready? Right there, put your finger, read with me. A certain bank account promises a 25% simple interest on the original investment increase every year. With an initial investment of $4,000, how much money will be in the account after 28 years? So I'm bringing up my calculator here. I'm going to minimize that and come back to it. So at the zero year, you have what's called the principal. And our principal is initial investment of $4,000. So at zero years, I'm sitting at my initial investment, which is $4,000. Now to do simple interest, we're going to use this a very simple equation. To get our interest, it's going to be the principal times the rate times the year. Or technically, in this case, well, time is usually, but then for us, our time is year. So I'm going to use T for time. So we take that principal, 4,000, and we're going to times it by... 25% times one year. And of course, if you look carefully, that's basically one quarter. So 25% of 4,000 is 1,000. For those of you who are like, what did she just do? What? 0. 0.25. 25% times 4 thousand and technically it's times one okay so that's a thousand dollars now that's interest so i get interest which means after one year my actual balance is going to be the principal plus the interest it's going to be five thousand dollars okay two years initial principal rate Time. So it's 4,000 times 4.25 times my, that's one, times now two years. And that's again one quarter of 4,000, which is 1,000 times two. So my interest now is 2,000. That means my balance after two years will be $6,000. You see what's going on here? 4,000 times 25% at three years will get me an additional $3,000. So my balance from the original, okay, is going to be $7,000. Last one, 4,000 times 0 0.25 times 4. So after four years, I'm going to add $4,000. So my money is 8,000. So if I were to graph this, it's going to look like this. My independent variable is time because the time doesn't change. My money changes because of the passage of time. So my cause is my money. That's my cause. Excuse me, my cause is time and my effect is money. So when we go to graph this zero year, I have $4,000.
that one year, I have $5,000. Two years, $6,000. Three years, $7,000. And of course, at four years, $8,000. Now let's graph these points and you'll see how this is predictive. Okay, and you want to be as accurate as possible, so use a straight edge, please. So our x axis is our time, and our y axis is going to be money. Okay, so our first point is zero, 04. So at zero years, at zero years, we have $4,000. So that right there is zero, 04,000. At our first year, we have $5,000. So first year, $5,000. At our second year, $6,000, so second year, use your straight edge to keep that as accurately as possible. It's going to go right there. At second year, $6,000 is the green. At the third year, $7,000. I'm going to put that under third year, 7,000. And of course, the fourth year is 8,000. So there's your plot. So in a financial realm, what you would do is you would have this account and you would have this straight line. And rather than computing, making 28 different calculations there to get to the 28th year, financial advisor, or even you could just see this line here, and it's predictive. So to find what would be at 30, at 28 years, we come here, 25, 26, 27, 28. And we go straight up. That's why you want to do this accurately. That's 28 year mark. And then we come over here and we see where it aligns. At 28 years, it is being a little tricky here. And then you bring it across, and you will see the predicted rate right here is, if you graph this correctly, a little off, it's going to be about $32,000. Yeah, I tilted my line slightly off. This was perfectly graphed. I'd actually be going right there. And how do I know it's $32,000? Because principal or interest equals principal times rate times time. My principal was $4,000 times my rate, 0 0.25, times my time, which is 28 years. That's going to get me $28,000 added back to the original principal, $32,000. So if this was perfectly graphed, that line would have gone through that dot. It's hard to perfectly graph on a computer. Hopefully yours is 
slightly more accurate than mine. And then, so this is how it's used in the financial realm. Once again, let's label it. Okay, down here, our x-axis is what's called the independent variable. And the y-axis is called the dependent variable. better known as cause and effect. This is a practical example of how graphing of lines are used in a predictive nature in the financial realm.